Welcome back to another episode of Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament tonight, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Sit tight, we will be right back. Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament. Rabbi Michael Skoback is going to teach us a little bit about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <laughs> Welcome back, Rabbi. Such a pleasure always, as usual. How are you doing? It is awesome <laughs> being here with you. I feel the same way. I feel the same way. That's cool. Uh, yeah, so a good, good title for the night. I mean, I think just the title alone uh, is going to gonna be very intriguing to so many people because um, you know, pretty much everybody in this whole global biblical when i say biblical i mean you know genesis through the christian bible also which they've joined together at the hip um the, their whole big thing is when is what they would say when is jesus coming back we would say was jesus ever here to begin with no um, that's not the right way of saying it. but the point being <laughs> the question is still valid um everybody wants to know when is the messianic era really going to happen even the christians on their side to be fair um and you have a lot to say about this you've already said a lot about this um jesus told his disciples uh, you know behold i come quickly right but he never showed up i mean how quickly is quick after two thousand years and so uh Going back to the main title, when is this whole messianic era happening? When is the end times? How do we know? You know, and I'm hoping you will add your commentary. Uh, you know, in with my question <laughs> and with your teaching of tonight's show. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, that, hope, hope no one's going to be shocked by any major revelations on my part. <laughs> um, okay, just stay tuned for the exact date of. <laughs> <laughs> will not be provided. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> Very good. Very good. So, um, All right, chapter five here is really a continuation of the discussion that Paul started back in chapter four about the rapture. And Paul basically addresses here the concerns um, of the Thessalonians about the return of Jesus and when it's going to happen. That seems to be the big question on everyone's mind. So it's not just a question people are asking today. You know, when is the when is the end times going to come? When is the rapture? When is the Messiah coming? Well, everyone wants to know. This was a massive question two thousand years ago, and I mentioned last week that there was apparently a tradition among the followers of Jesus that he would return within the generation. And there were a number of passages in the Gospels. I believe he never said them. I believe these are words that were put into his mouth because I don't believe that he thought he was going to die and not complete his mission. I, I think that, you know, when he came to think of himself as the Messiah, I think that he assumed that he would actually bring the redemption. And it's very clear from the uh, Christian scriptures that his followers assumed the same thing. They assumed that I believe um, he was going to inaugurate the messianic age, which meant the redemption of Israel, etc. And so uh, I don't think that he was speaking while he was alive about having to return. Uh, I, I think these are words that were put into his mouth, but the words that were put into his mouth were that for example, this generation will not pass away until the Son of Man returns, etc. So there was a tradition, a strong tradition, that um, you know they would have to wait, but not longer than one generation. And it's now, when Paul's writing 1 Thessalonians, it's around the year 55, which is about 25 years after the crucifixion, which is about the expiration of a generation. And so there was widespread expectation um, you know, that Jesus was going to return when Paul is basically writing this letter. And you can imagine that, you know, th even though this was the expectation, there were no imminent signs that anything was going to happen. Um, it didn't look like anything was happening. And so probably, you know, Paul was getting 
uh, in his inbox, you know, these desperate inquiries like what's going on, what's taking so long, when is it going to happen? So he, again, addresses this question here in chapter five. And um, in the beginning of the chapter, in verses one and two, he tells the Thessalonian church that he doesn't really have any need to write to them about these issues, about this matter, because he says they know full well that it would happen suddenly. He says to them, you know that it's going to happen suddenly. He says, just like a thief coming in the night. So that's how he begins the chapter. You know, they, they have these pressing concerns and he says, I have no need to write to you because basically, you know, full well that it's going to happen suddenly like a thief coming in the night. So I have a few questions about these these initial verses. Number one, um, why should the Thessalonians know about this? Why, why should they have known that the return of Jesus, the su supposed return of Jesus, would happen suddenly like a thief coming in the night? Meaning that these people were never students of Jesus. They never met Jesus. They never heard Jesus allegedly say, you know, we find this in Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 to 43, where Jesus says that, you know, no one knows when it's going to happen. It's going to happen suddenly like a thief coming in the night. Um, but they never heard that from Jesus. And um, there's no evidence. We don't have any written evidence that Paul taught them this idea previously. So um, why is it that, you know, he's assuming that they should know this? It's interesting just by the way, that throughout all of Paul's writings, we find that he virtually never quotes anything that Jesus said. Um, it seems, I mean, oddly, that Paul seems to know virtually nothing about Jesus other than he was born and that he was crucified. But in, in all the writings of Paul, he doesn't really tell us anything else about the life of Jesus, and he virtually never quotes anything that Jesus taught. It's quite fascinating. Um, and we would know why, by the way, because he never met Jesus. And, um, you know, all of his knowledge, he claims, comes from personal revelations. Um, you know, I, I personally would take the view that Jesus never came and, and revealed things to Paul. I believe that everything that Paul is claiming um, that he received from Jesus in a revelation, I believe these are all the products of Paul's imagination. And uh, he just rubber stamps it by saying that it came to him through Jesus. But it's interesting that, um, you know, here he seems to expect that the, that the Thessalonians would know this idea that the return of Jesus is going to come suddenly like a thief in the night, why? Why does he assume that they knew this and that because they knew it already, there's no need for him to write about it? But then this passage gets even stranger because um, why would there be no reason to write about this topic if the Thessalonians didn't know about it? Meaning that, again, I'm assuming that for argument's sake, the Thessalonians did not know this teaching about the uh, rapture or the return of Jesus being something that will happen unexpectedly and suddenly like a thief in the night. So again, if they didn't know that idea, why wouldn't there be a need for Paul to write about it? Meaning that he starts off the chapter saying, I don't really need to write to you about this, but I would say, why not? Why not? Because they probably never knew about this idea. And finally, if there really wasn't a reason for Paul to write about this, meaning maybe it's true. Maybe Paul did previously, um, you know, teach them about this idea. So that's what Paul's saying here. I have no need to write to you about this. So let's say that's the case that Paul is saying, I have no need to write to you about this. Uh, presumably because he's already taught them about it. Again, it's not mentioned anywhere in the text where Paul taught this, but let's just say for argument's sake that Paul taught it and it wasn't written down. But let's say that that's what we learn here, that Paul is claiming that, look, you guys, I don't need to write about this. I've already taught it to you. You should know this already. 
But then Paul goes right ahead and, and writes about it. So then the, the, the beginning of this chapter gets off to, I think, a pretty strange footing because he basically says that I don't need to write to you about this. And it seems pretty clear to me that he does have a need to write about it because this is a, a topic they don't seem to know about. But even if you want to insist that they already knew about this and Paul had no reason to write about it, it, what's bizarre is that he goes straight ahead and he writes about it. <laughs> so I, I haven't been able to figure out the, the beginning of this chapter. Now, in verse two, Paul makes reference to this idea of the day of the Lord. And, um, you know, it's not obviously, um, I shouldn't say so obviously, but in the Tanakh, it's not really only a, uh, a period of time of one day. Um, it's really more of an epoch, an era, a period of time. And basically, the idea of this day of the Lord, it, it comes up many times in the Tanakh. And we find a number of things that it refers to. Number one, it refers to a time when Israel will be redeemed physically and spiritually. So we will redeem, will be redeemed. Israel is going to be redeemed physically from their enemies. Uh, let's not forget that Israel has been oppressed and hated and despised and rejected and, um, you know, murdered and exiled ever since we were born, basically, as a nation. It's been what, what historians write about is history's longest hatred. And so the, the Bible, the Tanakh, speaks about a time when that's going to end. That's going to be during this day of the Lord, that we will be redeemed physically, and as well, Israel's going to re be redeemed spiritually. Now, what does that mean? What it means in the Tanakh, and this is very, very clear, is that those who tormented Israel, not just that they're going to be punished, that's, that's for the physical torment, that's for the physical persecution. So one of the elements of the day of the Lord is when there'll be judgment upon the enemies of Israel. But the other side of it is on a spiritual side where all of those people and nations and religions, etc., who mocked Israel spiritually, they're going to acknowledge that Israel was right all along. That's one of the elements of the day of the Lord. Um, we see this in Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 19 to 20, where the nations of the world, they come and they confess to Israel that they have, they have inherited just basically lies and things of no value. They're, they're confessing, basically, to Israel that the beliefs that they've had all along are not true. We see this also in the very well-known passage in Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 8, verses 22 to 23, where it says that what's going to happen during this period of time is that basically the entire world is going to come to the Jewish people and say, look, we want to follow you because we understand that God is with you. For, for throughout history, we've assumed that God is not with you. We've assumed that God has abandoned you. We've assumed that God has rejected you. We've assumed that we are the people that have the true path to God. And what the Tanakh teaches us is that in the future, during the day of the Lord, the nations of the world will acknowledge, no, they didn't have the true path to God. It's Israel that did, and they're going to say, we want to follow you because we know that God is with you. And you find this theme repeatedly throughout the book of Isaiah, especially the last chapters in Isaiah, where it speaks about all the nations of the world coming to the light of Israel. Isaiah speaks about the fact that Israel is supposed to be a light unto the nations. Isaiah says this twice uh, in the middle of the book of Isaiah. But then you get to Isaiah chapter 60, and he tells us that one day the nations of the world will come to your light. And what you find in chapter 60, it's an incredible, these last chapters are quite amazing. If you read verses, let's say, 14 to 15 in Isaiah, it speaks about this time when all those people that despised you and hated you will come to acknowledge 
your worth and your value. Um, it's a complete about face that the scriptures speak about. So this day of the Lord is essentially a time when, number one, all of the people that persecuted Israel physically will stop and they will be punished. And all of those people who rejected Israel spiritually will acknowledge that they were wrong all along and that Israel was right. And finally, the most important element of the day of the Lord, it's going to be a not again, not a day, a 24 hour day, but a period of time when it's going to be the, 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 the period of the Lord, meaning one of the main prophecies throughout all of the um, prophets is that there's going to come a time in history when every human being knows the Almighty. Every human being knows God. And so we find, for example, in Jeremiah chapter 31, the famous passage of the New Covenant. So we're told that there's going to come a time when there will be no need to teach anyone to know God because I, Jeremiah says, because they're all going to know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. And then we have the famous passage in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, which ends every Jewish prayer service, which says in that day, again, again, not a 24 hour day, in that period of time, in that era, in that epoch, God will be one and his name will be one. Um, at this point in time, God is not one in the world. You know, we say in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, hero Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And Rashi explains that to be really referring to this verse in Zechariah, that the proclamation that the Jews make throughout history is hero Israel. The Lord is our God. We have a connection to the creator. We have a connection to the almighty. But one day God will be one. So hero Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. But that is a future accomplishment. The Lord will be one when the entire world acknowledges God. And that's the main element of this day of the Lord. It's going to be the time in history when the entire world knows God. And we find this described again throughout the, the Tanakh, throughout the book of Psalms, throughout the prophets. It's probably one of the most important elements of what we refer to as the messianic age. Now, in verse three, Paul speaks about the destruction of the wicked. And he says that this destruction will catch non-believers by surprise. And he says it's going to come suddenly upon them like the birth pangs of a pregnant woman. Now, we have such a concept in, in the rabbinic literature. Rabbinic literature speaks about a period of um, turmoil a horrible turmoil before the redemption finally hits. Um, again, you know, if you want to think about the redemption as a new birth, a new age. So prior to the birth, there is the birth pangs. And we call this in Hebrew, Hevelei Mashiach, the birth pangs of the Messiah. And the Talmud speaks about this period of time. There's passages in the tractate Sota and in tractate Sanhedrin, and I'll just share with you some of the elements of what they describe as what will be going on in the world right before, prior to the Messianic age. We're told that um, there'll be epidemics and horrible diseases. I mean, certainly something that we're facing now. Um, there'll be blasphemy, blaspheming going on in the world. We have this whole movement today in the world of the new atheists, people that just basically dismiss the idea of God. We're told there's going to be a lack of scholarship and a lack of uh, education. We're told that wisdom itself is going to be denigrated. We're told that there'll be international wars and conflicts, that there'll be famines, that there will be poverty and runaway inflation, that there'll be an increase in chutzpah, um, it's hard to translate chutzpah into English. Um, you know, the simplest translation would be having a lot of nerve, uh, insolence or impudence. Um, but the Talmud says that that's going to be the, the name of the game. That's going to be the state of affairs prior to the coming of the Messiah. People will not 
have respect for others and they're going to act in ways that are disrespectful. The pious, we're told, pious people will be mocked and despised. Truth will be scarce. Truth is going to be very scarce before the revelation of the messianic age. We're told there's going to be generational conflict. Um, there's going to be a lack of respect that children have for their elders and for their parents. And we're told that there'll be irresponsible and um, really in uh, just um, just totally useless and irresponsible leadership and governments in the world before the coming of the Messiah. Now, if you listen carefully to this list of some of the elements that the script that these Talmud speaks about as the birth pangs of the Messiah, it sounds like a horoscope that people have been able to see these signs in every generation. Every generation has impudence and has wars and has poverty. It's not as if this is a one time affair. Um, it's just that there are certain times in history when these elements seem to be accelerating, meaning that it's almost the norm. <laughs> the reality is that we're living in a broken world. And so the world obviously is screwed up and is messed up. But there are certain times when it seems that these negative uh, elements accelerate and are getting you know, seriously worse in a dramatic way. And, you know, that's probably when people start to say, well, you know, obviously the redemption can come at any time and the Messiah can come at any time. But it really looks like we're right around the corner now because look at what's going on um, now. What's interesting is that um, in both Jewish and Christian sources, there have been, you know, going back forever attempts to predict when all of this is going to happen. I remember um, I'm pretty sure this is the name of the book. I remember back in 1988, someone put out a book, Christian put out a book that was called 88 Reasons to Believe that the Rapture is Going to Happen in 1988. And the funny thing was that a year later, he put out a second book that was entitled 89 Reasons to, to Believe that the Rapture is Going to Happen in 1989. And it becomes almost humorous because there are a whole industry of Christian date setters, people that, you know, are constantly trying to look for signs um, and trying to predict that it's, you know, that it's happening now based upon, you know, the fact that they've invented RFID chips and the fact that they have, you know, every medical and scientific advancement is seen as some kind of a sign uh, that's, that's, you know, sort of indicating that the end times are upon us. Um, because one of the elements in the Christian view of the end times, it's very ironic, is that the Christian view speaks about the Antichrist bringing peace to the world. So any movement towards world peace or world unification, which would normally be seen as a good thing, Christian uh, people that are deeply into eschatology and the end times, they see it as very negative, um, you know, because they assume that this is the Antichrist at work. But you have had um, countless Christians over the course of history trying to prognosticate and predict um, exactly when the end times are going to begin. Um, and this, you know, has basically gone on nonstop. Um, in Jewish sources, there seems to be a somewhat ambiguous attitude toward forecasting when the end times will arrive. And I wanted to spend a few minutes just going, just tracing a little bit of this history. If you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 49, this is towards the end of the book of Genesis. So Jacob is about to die. And so we're told in Genesis chapter 49, verse 1, it says that Jacob called his sons and said, come together, right? Gather together that I may tell you what will happen to you in the end of days. It actually uses that expression in Hebrew, acharit hayamim, the end of days. And so verse 1 in chapter 49, Jacob says to his sons, come together, gather, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to reveal What's going to happen to you in the end of days? And then verse two, he says, assemble 
and listen, you sons of Jacob, pay attention to your father Israel. So it's it's strange that verse two seems to be redundant, meaning in verse one, he's already called his sons to assemble, to gather together. So why does he do this again in verse two? That's one question. And the second question is that if you look at verse one and verse two, there's a major difference in verse one. After telling them to gather together and to come together, he says, I'm going to reveal to you what's going to happen in the end of days. But in verse two, where again, he told them to gather together and come together, there's no mention of the end of days. And so the Talmud in tractate Psachim 56a basically tells us, and this is quoted by Rashi in his commentary to the Torah, that Jacob did want, Jacob desired to reveal to his sons, um, you know, the kates, the end, what's going to be, and to, to give them a bird's eye view of the future. But uh, the Talmud says that the Almighty was not interested in having Jacob reveal this. And so the Almighty didn't allow Jacob to reveal this to his sons. And that's why in verse two, there's no mention of having the end of days revealed to them. It was something that was planned and hoped for on the part of Jacob, but he wasn't able to uh, reveal this. Um, And we see that this kind of reticence to spill the beans, so to speak, is seen in the book of Daniel as well. We know that the book of Daniel engages in some speculation about the end times. And in chapter 12 in the book of Daniel, in verses four and nine, God tells Daniel that he is to seal up and to keep secret these matters, right? He's not to reveal them. He's to keep them secret and to seal them up. And so you see that, you know, there is a tendency in the Tanakh not to reveal these kinds of issues. And actually, the Talmud itself in Tractate Sanhedrin 97b, the Talmud actually puts a curse on anyone who makes predictions about when the end will take place. Now, what's truly bizarre is that despite all of this, despite the fact that the scriptures don't seem to be um, terribly in favor of making these kind of things public, and the Talmud actually puts a curse on people who make predictions about the timing of the end of days, um, historically, numerous Torah sages, I mean, the greatest Torah scholars that we've had actually made calculations and predictions about when the Messiah would come. (laughs) And so the question is, how do they get away with this? Meaning that how, if the tradition is so strongly against it, how do they, um, you know, offer these predictions? So there are a number of ways of dealing with this problem. Number one, um, that there are, um, commentaries who say that this prohibition itself was only made for people living very, very far away from the time the Messiah would come. Meaning that, um, you know, they didn't want someone living, let's say, in the year 400 to say, well, the Messiah is going to come in the year 1500 because they were afraid that if people thought that it's going to be, you know, 1100 years away, they would get very, very discouraged and they would give in to despair. Um, So the only time when it was prohibited was if you were making a prediction that was going to only come true many, many, many years in the future. There's a very famous story that's told about the Malbim. The Malbim was a great Jewish Bible commentary from the 19th century. And um, he made predictions as well. He himself made predictions. And they asked him, you know, that the, the, his colleagues and other rabbis said, how do you make predictions when the Talmud says you're not supposed to make these predictions? So he told them a story. He said, you know, there was a father that was going on a very, very long trip with his son. 
And they got into their wagon and, and the, the father beats the horses. He whips the horses and they take off and they're traveling for weeks and weeks. And after, you know, a month or two, the son says to his father, the son's like maybe 12 years old, 13 years old. And he says, dad, are we, dad, are we almost there yet? And his father says, no, we're not almost there yet. And they travel another few weeks. The kid says, are we almost there yet? The father says, no, we're not almost there yet. And then another few weeks go by. And the son says to his father, we almost there yet. And the father says, no, we're not almost there yet. And then a week or so later, the son says to his father, we almost there yet. And the father smacks him across the face and the kid goes flying off the wagon, shocked. <laughs> He's like very shaken up and he dusts himself off and he gets back up on the wagon. And he sits down next to his father and now he's quiet and they take off and they're, uh, you know, they're going again on their trip. And uh, they're traveling another few weeks and the father sees someone by the side of the road and the father stops this person and says, are we, are we almost near this city yet? And the person on the side of the road says, yeah, you'll be there in uh, you know, a couple of days. So the son was shocked and the son said, daddy, when I asked you this very same question, you smacked me in the face. And then you went and asked the exact same question. So what gives? So the father said, listen, son, the difference is that when I asked the question, we were almost there. So the Malvin said that you cannot make predictions way, way, way in advance because it's just going to dishearten people to have to know that here Rabbi so-and-so predicted the Messiah is going to come in a thousand years. But the Malbim said, if your prediction is about an imminent arrival, then you're not going to um, dishearten anyone. And actually, there were commentaries that said that this is precisely why the Talmud um, didn't want people making predictions. They said, because if you make predictions about when the Messiah is going to come and it doesn't pan out, then people might give up on the hope of the Messiah coming. And that's why the Talmud was nervous and was afraid. Maybe it's better not to make predictions because if you make predictions and it turns out that those predictions aren't fulfilled, people are going to just get cynical and they're going to say, ah, this is just a pipe dream. It's never going to happen. But the rabbi said that, you know what? If the concern is about people not giving up hope, it could be that you'll be living in a generation when things are so difficult for the Jewish people, they're being tortured and persecuted so severely that you need to give them hope. And therefore, it would be appropriate at that kind of time to let them know that the Messiah is not so far away. And even if those hopes might be dashed, I mean, maybe that'll be it'll be fulfilled. But they said that the concern is of people losing hope, but they said the exact same concern can be a reason to make such predictions because it could be the kind of thing that gives people hope that are desperate for hope. Another explanation for how rabbis could have made predictions about the coming of the Messiah is that it's only prohibited to give a definitive date, meaning if you say that the Messiah for sure is going to come, you know, in September of the year 2023, that's a problem. But if you just offer it as a possibility that, you know, you're suggesting that this might be a date that is ripe or appropriate, or that might be the kind of day that is, um, you know, it, it looks like a, a good chance, meaning if you hedge your bets, and you don't make it as a definitive prediction, that would be okay. And another approach has been that the Talmud only pre only um, forbade people from making predictions if the prediction was based upon astrological signs. But if the prediction is based upon scripture and the reading of the prophets, then it does, it's not inappropriate, meaning that's why the scriptures were given to us in order to learn things and to derive things. So these are some of the approaches that were taken to explain how, even though there is this 
preference that we don't engage in date setting that some of the great rabbis in history actually did. And what what's interesting is that if you go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 20, chapter 60, chapter 60 in Isaiah, verse 22, so the prophet there says, Be'ita um, achishena, which means in its time, I will hasten it. Now, the rabbis noticed that this seems to be self-contradictory. In its time means that there is a particular time when it could happen. And to say I'm going to hasten it means that it's not going to be in its time. It's going to come before the set time. So the rabbis explain that indeed there is a set time for the redemption to happen, that God knows that, you know, in his calculations, there is a specific time by which the redemption has to happen. There is such a set time. However, the prophet Isaiah tells us that God can hasten it, meaning God can actually make it happen before the appropriate set time. That will happen if the Jewish people as a nation um, repent, if we go through a revival. Um, you know, the, the what the date predictors did the people that set dates and predicted dates is they basically identified um, times which seemed specifically primed like you have to prime an engine you know they they, they said you know there are times in history that seemed particularly primed for the messianic age to begin however that will only happen if the Jewish people materialize um, that potential, meaning that, again, one of the teachings of the Tanakh is that the redemption will only come when Israel repents, when Israel engages in national uh, revival and national uh, repentance. You see this, for example, in the beginning of the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30, the first few verses speak about a national return of the people of Israel to God. Massive repentance. Meaning that throughout Jewish history, there have always been a righteous remnant of Jews who have been loyal to God. Um, but for most of Jewish history, that wasn't the norm. Um, you know, the norm has varied today. You know, it's hard to know exactly, but maybe 20 percent today of Jews are careful to follow the Torah. That means at about 80 percent or not. And so there's a lot of um, repentance that we need as a, as a people. And Deuteronomy chapter 30 says that that's going to happen, that national return to God and that will be followed by the redemption. And we see the same teaching in Isaiah chapter 59, where God says that the Redeemer will come to Zion to those people of Jacob who turn from their sins. So the coming of the Redeemer, the coming of the Messiah, is predicated upon national repentance by the Jewish people. And so... Um, what the Talmud says is that what would happen if the date, the date that God planned comes and we have not repented, meaning that, again, there is a set date. We could always make that date happen sooner if we turn to God. But let's say the Jewish people are not turning to God and that date finally arrives. So then what happens? So the Talmud says that what God will do is essentially force us to repent, meaning that the Talmud says that God will send terrible persecution to the Jewish people, and there'll be no choice then for us to uh, call out to our Father in heaven. And so that persecution becomes a catalyst for national uh, repentance. And some people, I should say, um, for just to make things 
uh, to wrap things up a little bit here, that some people have said that even those opportune times, we've had them over history. There have been times when, you know, for example, the Talmud teaches that that during the time of Hezekiah, that Hezekiah himself could have been the Messiah. That was an, a, an opportune time. And the only problem they said is that when, um, you know, he had a, his redemption, his personal redemption, he didn't sing praises to God. He didn't uh, thank God immensely. He didn't sing Hallel. He didn't sing Shira to God. And so for that, the, the, the opportunity was squandered. And there have been other times in history that were opportune, that were special dates that seemed ripe for the redemption to begin, but they didn't materialize. But our, some of the commentaries point out that even though they didn't materialize fully on the, um, let's say, material, physical realm, but it's possible that on some spiritual level, um, they did work, they did have some effect, and that we moved closer to the goal line at these times. It's hard really to know. So um, I want to move on now to verse 4, and actually it's verses 4 to 6. Um, verses 4 to 6 speak about this idea that the believers in Jesus live in light and all others are seen as godless and living in darkness. And, you know, the way uh, Judaism would view Christians is that we see them as believing essentially in God plus something else, God plus a human being. And I discussed a few weeks ago in our in our program that according to many rabbis, that's considered idolatry, even if people are not Jewish to worship God plus anything else is idolatry. And there were other rabbis who took the opinion that for people who did not hear God speak at Mount Sinai, prohibiting exactly this, meaning that when God says, don't have any other gods before my face, that was the prohibition of having uh, other entities in addition to the creator that you worship. And since non-Jews did not hear that, that would not be prohibited. And so there are some rabbis that took the view that to believe in God plus Jesus would not have been idolatry for people that are not Jewish. For Jewish people, it's certainly idolatry because the Ten Commandments there in Exodus chapter 20 prohibits specifically having anything in addition to the Creator. Um, but basically, what's interesting is that from a Jewish point of view, Christians would be seen as believers in God, but believers in, in God plus something else, whereas Christians see Jews as godless, as godless. I, I mentioned once before on this program that um, I, I went to a, a, a two-part lecture by a Messianic rabbi. The title was, Who is a Jew? And at the end of the second lecture, I went up to him privately and I said, am I a Jew? And he says, no, you're not a Jew because you don't praise God. You don't believe in God. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, this is the dichotomy that Paul speaks about here, that believers in Jesus are living in light and everyone else is seen as godless and living in darkness. In verse 18, I'm getting towards the end of the chapter now, in verse 18, Paul says to give thanks in all circumstances. And I found an interesting comment by the ESV study Bible which says that Christians are to be marked by thanksgiving. That's the mark of a Christian. What's interesting is that that's actually the mark of a Jew. You know, the word Jew in Hebrew is Yehudi. Um, Yehudi from the name Yehuda. Yehuda is literally someone who praises, thanks God. Um, his mother, Leah, Judah's mother, Le named him Yehuda. Why? It's interesting. The sages of the Talmud tell us that Leah was the first person to ever really give thanks to God. Now, everyone else, you know, you see throughout the book of Genesis, people were thanking God. But thanks in the sense that she acknowledged that she received something she was not entitled to. Because there was a tradition back then that Jacob had four wives and that he was going to have 12 sons. So everyone assumed that if there are four wives, 
going to have 12 sons, each of the wives would have three children, three sons. But when Leah had her fourth son, Yehuda, that's when she names him Yehuda. I'm going to acknowledge, thank God, because now she's not getting what she supposedly deserved. She's not getting what she was entitled to. She's getting more than she was entitled to. She's getting more than she should have been expecting. And so she expresses this kind of gratitude and praise to God. And so this is the name Yehudi, a Jew. Um, you know, in the book of Esther, Mordechai is called a Yehudi. Um, and that's been essentially, you know, once the name Israelite, uh, you know, sort of fell into disuse, although you could still use it, but Jews today are less called Israelites than called Jews, all of us, because that's the foundation of what it means to be a Jew, to be one who praises God. And the very first words that every Jew says in the morning, just as they're waking up after sleeping at night, they say, ani, uh, for a woman would say, ani, but it basically is, I acknowledge you, God, I thank you, God, that you returned my soul to me, because while I was sleeping, the Talmud says sleep is one sixtieth of death. We're not really doing anything. And so when a person wakes up in the morning, there's an acknowledgement. You know, there are people who don't wake up in the morning. And so the very first thing a person does is to just thank God that they're alive. And so I found it interesting that the ESV study Bible basically co-opts this idea that this was the, the, the definition of a Jew. He makes it into the definition of. Um, what he calls the, what Christians are marked by are people who are giving thanks. And we saw that earlier, by the way, that in the Tanakh, the day of the Lord is a day when the enemies of Israel are punished and Israel is rewarded. And Paul basically turns that on its head and says, no, the end times are a time when the day of the Lord is when the non-believers in Jesus will be punished. And the believers in Jesus will be rewarded. So you have all these concepts from the Tanakh that are basically co-opted by the New Testament, by the Christian Bible. Um, moving on to verses 19 to 21, and we'll end with this. Um, Paul writes at the end of the chapter here in verses 19 to 21 that it's important not to ignore prophetic messages, that there's prophecy that people will utter in the church and you shouldn't ignore people that are prophesying. Um, now, we've discussed in the past that you don't become a prophet because you claim to be one. A person's not considered a prophet simply because they insist they're a prophet because the truth is every false prophet claims that they're a prophet. Um, so we know that for a person to be a prophet in the Tanakh, God gave us a way of determining, and that is through the leading um, courts, through the leading Torah scholars, they are the ones that have to decide whether someone is a true prophet or a false prophet. And we know that, um, you know, at the time in the first century, no one in the church, Jesus, Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, none of these people were validated as true prophets by the leading Jewish judges and sages. And the truth is that we know prophecy actually ended about 400 years before this. And so this idea that Paul speaks about, it's not really speaking about biblical prophets in the sense that we have prophecy in the Hebrew Bible. But what's interesting is that Paul says it's important to test the prophets. Yeah, you can't just Paul says, you know, assume that everything that people say is prophecy. You have to be discerning. You have to be able to test the prophets. And it's interesting that there are many Christians today who claim the office of being a prophet. Um, you know, you get any Christian magazine and they have all these people that advertise themselves as prophets, but they're, they're not universally accepted in the church. So the question is, when Paul says that you have to test prophecy. How is it tested? How do you test prophets? So the ESV study Bible um, says that tests presumably include the prophecy's conformity with authoritative revelation. 
you know, he's saying that if a person prophesies and it contradicts revelation, obviously that prophecy has to be thrown out. The problem is that the fact that someone's utterance conforms with um, prior revelation, that doesn't prove that someone is a prophet, meaning that I probably, you know, teach, I don't know how many hours a week, and I think that 100% of what I teach is in line with scripture. It doesn't make me a prophet, meaning just because a person says things or teaches things that are not contradictory to scripture doesn't mean that they're a prophet. So this criteria is not really significant. It's not sufficient. Um, meaning that if someone contradicts scripture, that would disqualify them. But someone who says things that don't contradict scripture, that in and of itself is obviously not a proof that someone is a prophet. Now, the TLV, the Living Version um, Study Bible, quotes the Didache. The Didache is a very fascinating document. It, ev it might even predate the um, writings of Paul. They think it may be from around the year 50. And this was an early manual. It was a handbook of the um, followers of Jesus, of the church. And they write in the Didache that not everyone who speaks about spiritual things is a prophet, only if the person's conduct is like the Lord. Now, obviously, this as well is not a reliable criteria. Um, you know, you have saintly people from every religion in the world. Um, that does not make them a prophet because they're living a good life and they're kind and they're gentle and they're humble. And, you know, they tell the truth all the time. There are plenty, plenty of people you know, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, Jews, what have you, that are saintly people. They live righteous lives. That, again, in and of itself does not mean that they are conveying the word of the Lord. And I have one final thought, and we'll wrap up for tonight. Um, when, when Paul speaks here about testing the prophecies, is he referring to a central body that will test the prophecies, meaning is there some kind of a church body responsible for validating everyone's prophecy, or is this a, a, a commandment that's given to each and every Christian in their own private life? And I would say from the context, if you read Paul carefully here, he's really speaking to every single individual Christian, that when the individual hears prophecy, they have to test it. And so... How do they do this? How does the individual test prophecy? What's the criteria? So John MacArthur, in his commentary to this passage, says, what is found to be good should be embraced. What is evil should be shunned. Now, again, that's a very, very um, non-useful criteria. These are very subjective categories, good and evil, um, you know, I would imagine that Abraham could have thought that God's commandment to sacrifice his son was evil. Maybe, maybe by testing that prophecy, Abraham would say, this is not the voice of God. So again, it's a very unreliable criteria for the individual Christian to say, well, based upon my, you know, thinking this prophecy is good or this prophecy is evil, uh, I don't think that becomes a helpful guidepost for evaluating prophecy. And so at the end of the day, Paul is simply giving Christians a uh, advice or a direction here that they, they don't have no way of implementing. They have no real accurate, credible way of testing whether someone's prophetic utterance is really, truly prophecy. At the end of the day, you know, if they like it and it sounds good to them, they'll say it's prophecy. Right. If they have a problem with it, they're going to reject it. And that obviously is not the criteria for prophecy. Um, so that's basically the end of First Thessalonians as far as I have been able to uh, put together. And uh, next time we meet, we'll, we'll begin at least uh, Second Thessalonians.
That sounds good. Sounds like begin at least might mean we get through it rather quickly. <laughs> okay. We will see. Yeah. Very I'm good. not making any predictions. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not setting any dates for when we will finish Second Thessalonians. That's funny. That's funny. Very good. All right. Uh, guys, just as a reminder, if you've subscribed to the YouTube channel but you haven't turned on notifications, uh, you won't get notified when we go live. And some of you who have uh, actually still don't get notifications. So send me a friend request on Facebook if we're not already. If we're on Facebook, then you need to go back to my page, not to Knock Talk page, but to the William Hall, and, and select follow, follow posts and things like that. Because a lot of times, like for example, I've got about 3,800 friends on Facebook, and only have about 250 that actually follow. So if you follow it, then you'll see all my current posts as I put them up, because I don't really use the to Knock Talk page for that. So anyway, uh, anyway, I hope you guys have a great evening and rabbi thank you so much for your time and all your uh, rich studies that you share with us thank you so much thank you and have a wonderful week and, thank you. Uh, and a happy father's day for next sunday thank you very much speaking of which we will not be live next sunday on my behalf not on rabbis he's always available for the most part uh <laughs> i'll be doing a, my first show in the morning while, it, while most people are still sleeping with rabbi singer but the rest of the shows will be canceled uh, for the rest of the day for father's day weekend so uh, i've got some family coming in town and going to enjoy some of that family time so thank you rabbi once again and thank you all for tuning in we'll see you again uh, in two weeks shalom shalom everybody peace <laughs>